you know, what, what would we think when Paul writes letters to the church? Wait, 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 what's the church? What, he writes to the church. Who's that? What's that? What is the church? How would we even know? The church gets established in the book of Acts, right? Who's in the church? What does it do? What is the point of the church? And by the way, we get a letter from Paul in Romans. Who's Paul? Thank you. <laughs> if you didn't hear that on the camera, who's Paul? Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome. Thanks for coming out for uh, the first night of the book of Acts, yeah? Um, which is kind of funny since we're preaching through it on Sunday. I've never actually done that before. It's just kind of funny how that worked out. But, but we kind of did it uh, because of Tom Sterling, who's not here. All right, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Although it's still early, right? <laughs> Tom, there you are. Oh, you're so funny. <laughs> I love it. But, you know, um, it fits perfectly. Because, uh, well, as we'll find, find out tonight a little bit as I begin to explain it, you know, like it is Luke volume two. Yeah. So anyways, grateful you all came out. Um, we don't have much to cover in terms of housekeeping and stuff because, uh, you know, we're not bringing food. We're not going to be bringing food. Um, so here we are and grateful for everybody that could make it here. Grateful for everybody that's at home tuning in. I think you're really going to enjoy this. Um, that was a lot of fun last week. Uh, it was just a fun Bible study. A lot of people said that, and I felt the same way about teaching it. The Bible study that was about the Bible. You know, you just got to love that. Um, shoots, uh, Alan's not here, but I wanted to clarify. Um, he asked about the Council of Nicaea. What about the Council of Nicaea? And I went and looked it up again. As far as I could tell, um, yeah, the Council of Nicaea was about the development of the theology of the Trinity and leading to the Nicene Creed. They took the Apostles' Creed, they developed a further, um, a sort of a further description of the Trinity, and they combined it together with a few other added items to, I think, including like they added the virgin birth and things like that, and came up with the Nicene Creed. Um, but I couldn't find anything about the canonization of scripture at the Council of Nicaea. That was at the Council of Carthage. So just, he asked that, and I didn't know the answer, and so there it was, okay. Um, but I do want to um, propose something to you tonight. I want you to use your imagination. Sounds like Barney, doesn't it? You know, we don't have nobody. Watch, you guys don't watch Barney anymore, right? Yeah, that was like, yeah, my kids' childhood, whatever. Anyways, um, they still do. They still do. Yeah, yeah, I know, yeah, yeah, Barney. Your kids probably grew up with Barney, yeah. No. No, we wouldn't let it. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah you know what happened to me? I was like, we will not do Barney, and then. Bless her heart, so Holly you know. Potter dropped off a whole shopping bag full of Barney videos. <laughs> and we made the mistake of showing the first one. But what does that have to do with anything? Oh, yeah. <laughs> use your imagination. Just use your imagination, okay? Just bear with me. I'm going to, like, give an allegory here. And you got to really use your imagination on this one. But imagine if next week Jesus came back. Like he said he would, right? But, like, in a way that didn't satisfy anybody, like all the pre-mill, post-trib, mid-trib, you know, amillennial, like, no, 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 it was all, nobody was right, right? And, and yet, clearly, it, it was Jesus, and he's like, okay, we're going to change everything. And we're like, oh, okay. Yeah, we're going to change the way we worship God. We're going to change the way we work, uh, work together as believers. In fact, uh, you're no longer going to be called Christians. Nope. Yeah. Oh, by the way, no more evangelism. Yeah, no, no more missions, nothing. Uh, we're going to completely change. We're not even going to meet on Sunday mornings anymore. Worship's going to be this completely different thing. Uh, we'll have a little bit of a sharing time. You can tell us how you feel about God. Um, by the way, and the only people that are allowed to play musical instruments will be trained, ordained people. So, like, we can't just let anybody, like, pick up a guitar and play anymore. That, that's over, yeah? Uh, we're going to meet on Wednesdays now, okay? And, um, yeah, and so change your schedule accordingly. You better get the day off work, yeah? And, um, and we're going to learn to communicate with God in a whole way. Uh, but I'm not going to tell you exactly yet how to do that. Uh, yeah, you'll figure it out. Oh, but yeah, you can use the New Testament and the Old Testament 
um, except for the parts where it refers to how you do church and community. You can't, none of that from the New Testament works anymore. Okay, yeah, good, good. Uh, the priesthood's going to be totally different. None of this, like, I feel I'm called to the ministry. No, 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 we're going to can all that. Uh, you can only be a pastor now if your dad was a pastor. Okay, yeah, good, glad you gave that. Oh, yeah, by the way, no more communion. Like, we're tossing communion, yeah. Uh, no more of that. Uh, we're going to do this new thing. It involves a goat, but we'll get back to that later. Yeah. And by the way, you, no longer will you be praying directly to God. So you know how you do that your morning, your morning prayer time? Yeah, it's not going to work it that way uh, anymore. What's going to happen is you're going to be submitting your requests to a certain qualified God, a guy, qualified priest, and he'll talk to God for you and get back to you uh, with, with, with an answer. Okay? Okay. <laughs> Everybody good with that? There wouldn't be any problem with that, would there be? I mean, there'd probably be no argument, no division in the church, no people having an idea. Uh, people, people would be quick to give up all that old stuff and just would embrace all the new stuff. There'd be nobody that would be like, no way, I'm, we're not going to give that, right? Wrong. Now, do you, do you guys get the point I'm making here? I wonder if you do. If you don't, if it wasn't obvious enough, I'll make it obvious. But we so forget, don't we? Christ comes. And man, the people that he's with, his people, have been worshiping God, doing community together before God for, what, 2,000 years? 1,600 years, I believe it was. Yeah, look that up. No, kidding. Like over almost 2,000 years. And now they're basically being told, yeah, everything's changing. You know the temple that was like the center of everything? Yeah, it's not the center of everything anymore. Yeah. Yeah. You know that whole priesthood thing? Well, now you're a priest. But can you, can you like the whole slaughtering of goats and everything? That you, all that stuff you used to do? Yeah. It's all gone. Forget it. Can you imagine? Look, one thing I know just from my 25 odd years of being a pastor is, man, people don't like change. And you can imagine there was probably youngsters going, yeah, this is awesome. Why go to the temple anymore? We don't have to go to the temple. We are the temple. Can you imagine what the 70-year-olds were thinking? I don't think so. What do you mean you're the temple? You are not the temple. Is that, am I making sense here? Yeah. Yeah. You can imagine there'd be some fear. Like, how do we know? We better know he really was God before we just toss, like, all the temple worship and goat sacrifice. I mean, we better know for sure that this Jesus you're telling me about is God, right? Yeah? And confusion. So what about the Feast of Tabernacles? We doing that anymore? How about the we, what is it, uh, the festival of tents? What, what about that? We doing that? Do I still got to wear my ringlets and grow my beard out? What? Well, and who's the authority? Who's in charge? Well, I think who put you in charge? <laughs> I didn't ask you, you know? Yeah. Uh, maybe we should just go back to what we know worked before. Can you imagine the temptation? Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe we better see what God is doing, but we'll kind of keep moving forward and maybe learn from our mistakes. And I just want to submit to you tonight, everything I just said, all that happened. That's exactly what happened. Man, human nature hasn't changed. People back then are just like people today. People don't like change. The youth likes change. Older people don't like change. And it happens slowly. So my point is this. Before we even put a toe into the book of Acts, I want to submit to you that Things that seem super obvious to us 2,000 years later with all this great tradition of theology and history and smart guys like, you know, Augustine and Clement and Luther and Calvin, these guys that figured out all this stuff, they implemented it, then it got kind of put through the court of public opinion and got washed into some modern day culture and then the Jesus people movement and here we are. Right? Right? Doing church the way we do church, right? But man, that did not happen right away. So my point is this. As we read about these people, 
We need to have a lot of grace for them, yeah? Really a lot of grace. When people say stupid things and we're like, oh, duh, why would they do that? Well, there's a reason why, right? And, and we would probably be the worst of them, right? I would probably. I'm not giving up that, right? Okay, so um, let's sort of review. Um, um, for thousands of years, They've been the people of the law, right? And they've been exercising the law because the law, remember, was ceremonial. How to, how to sacrifice a goat, on what days did you do, what, you know, what celebration, and everything was clearly defined how to do a incense sacrifice and all that stuff. The law was also social, how to handle yourselves in social situations, and it was also legal, like how to how to, what happens if, you know, your cow, your bull breaks into your neighbor's yard and then kills something and da-da-da, and how do you figure all that out, right? And then Jesus shows up, the long-awaited Messiah, um, and he fulfills all kinds of messianic expectation. Like, I think it's in the hundreds, you know, people that go through and count everything that Jesus fulfilled, every Old Testament prophecy prophecy that he fulfilled. So Bing, he fulfills all these prophecies, except he's not doing what the people expected him to do. Because here they are living under the oppression of Rome. Oh, great. The Messiah's come. Cool. We're going to make Rome great again. <laughs> I mean, we're going to make Israel great again, right? We're going to kick Rome out. Yeah, we're going to like, you know, be Israel. We're going to go back to the days of David right? Because now the son of David has arrived. It's going to be great. And then Jesus, you know, they keep asking him, you know, when, when, when are we going to start the revolution, Jesus? And he's like, the kingdom of God is near, <laughs> you know? You'll look for it here and you'll look for it there, right? You know, the kingdom of God is like a treasure. Hold that, hold that thought, bro. I'll get to it in a second, yeah? In fact, I want to submit to you, um, I think I told you guys the other night, I watched uh, Risen again, yeah? And it's really pretty fun because the Jewish leaders, and we're going to see this in the next couple of chapters, the Jewish religious leaders and the Romans, they don't know what to do with not only Jesus but his followers because they think they're all about power and authority. And so in, in the movie Risen, you know, the Roman Tribune guy is going, where have you stored your weapons? You know, and I think it's Bartholomew's going, oh, we don't have weapons, you know? <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're all about love, you know? And, and pilot guys come in and, you know, and they're like, where is this insurrection? And, you know, Bartholomew's like, it's everywhere. <laughs> and they're like, you know, and, and the disciples don't want their power. And these guys that are clinging to earthly power, they don't know how to deal with people that don't care about earthly power. They, it, 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 and then the funny thing is, is of course it ends up leading to the fall of Rome anyways, right? You know? And, and, but they, they don't know how to deal with it. It's so different. Brian, what are you going to say? Uh, that was all an assumption that he was going to be mm -hmm. a, a warrior. There was no prophecy. That oh, was... no. No, there's scripture that talks straight up about reestablishing the house of David and he will have victory over all the enemies. And so it wouldn't be hard to see how people would think, well, duh, clearly these guys are the enemy. Clearly we are oppressed. The Messiah is supposed to come back and have victory over our enemies. Only the victory was going to be over the greatest enemy of all, death, Right. Because Jesus didn't care much for, for global power. Earthly power didn't mean nothing. He came to defeat the spiritual power of death. And by the way, no, I, we would so be doing the same thing today. Because, I mean, just look at like how people read Revelation. Well, clearly, you know, the Babylonian uh, prostitute is Iraq. And, you know, and this is Russia. People are already doing all that right now, let alone back then, you can imagine. Yes, Lily? Can you show that movie here? Uh, can I show that movie here? I already returned it to Netflix. <laughs> I'll ask Kelly. Maybe Kelly do a movie night or something like that. Yeah. 
Yeah, it'd be fun. Or maybe like uh, we could do that on an off night. Uh, maybe a week I didn't feel like preparing something. Yeah, I'll just we'll show her. <laughs> we'll show her isn't. It might be a lot of fun, actually. Yeah, it might be a lot of fun. It's actually really good. And uh, yeah, okay, maybe we'll do that. Sounds like fun. Yeah, I'll pick a date. Yeah, but good, good question, Brad. It's a great question. Like, were they just making stuff up, or was there some scriptural? You know, if you remind me, I will go find you some scriptures that are prophetic about Jesus. That straight up, if you were living under the oppression of Rome, you would think this is why he's coming. Yeah, this is what he's going to do. Especially because if you think about how earthly minded we all are naturally, we all tend to think about, you know, well, doesn't Jesus want me to be happy and healthy, right? Isn't that why he's here? And it's hard to get people off that. Well, no, not necessarily. Jesus wants you to be obedient and, and he's preparing you for heaven. But in this life, no, actually, he says you might suffer quite a bit. But people tend to blow right past all the how I should suffer bit and get, get me to the part where I'm going to be okay and healed and everything, right? Okay, so absolutely. So Jesus is, gives them clues that things are going to be radically different, but he doesn't give a lot of detail. Like picture this. He tells the Samaritan woman at the well, in the future, the true believers will worship in spirit and in truth. Now, by the way, that sounds wonderful, doesn't it? But you can picture them going, well, what's that look like? <laughs> Worship in spirit and in truth in the temple? Or, or how? Like, you know what I mean? It's one of those things we hear, so I don't need to go to the temple? Just worship in spirit and truth. Okay. But where? In the temple? Like, you know what I mean? Like, what does that look like when you are a first century Jew? And, of course, you know, he explains to them that God loves them more than they can think. And as the ultimate example, he is the lamb. He, he allows himself um, to be sacrificed. Then he returns in his resurrected state after three days. You know, he's resurrected. He appears mystically and randomly, just kind of shows up sometimes, yeah. And then um, his followers, at this point... They're, they still believe in Jesus, but they don't really know what to do. How do we know that? Well, at one point, remember Peter guys go back. What do they start doing again? They go fishing. He said, wait for him. So, all right, we'll go wait. But I mean, imagine now we, we tend to think, you know, Jesus says, go to Nazareth and wait for me. I will meet you there. And so they go. But think about that. How long did they wait? What did they talk about? What do you think? Is he coming back? I don't know. We better go fishing. Right? <laughs> right? Did you, you know, you got to wonder if at a certain point they're going, well, maybe that was it. Like, really, maybe that was it. We don't know, yeah? Now, here's my point, right? Then, um, um, what if at that point, um, there's no book of Acts, we just go to Romans? Like, think about that for a second. What if we just skipped from John to Romans, right? You know, what, what do we think when Paul writes letters to the church? Wait, wait, wait. What's the church? What, he writes to the church. Who's that? What's that? What is the church? How would we even know? The church gets established in the book of Acts, right? Who's in the church? What does it do? What is the point of the church? And by the way, we get a letter from Paul in Romans. Thank you. <laughs> if you didn't hear that on the camera. Who's Paul? Who, what gives him the right to write letters on behalf of God? Who the heck is this guy? Do you understand how valuable now the book of Acts is? The book of Acts is the key link between the four Gospels and the entire rest of the New Testament. The whole rest of the New Testament would not make any sense without the book of of Acts, okay? So that's kind of exciting, huh? When I put it that way, right? Like where we're going. This is the linchpin for the whole New Testament. So let's briefly go over where, when, who, what for everything. Um, now, only since the uh, second century was it called Acts, which stood for, it's actually the full title is the Acts of the Apostles. Um, before that, it was actually called the History of Christian Origins. Isn't that interesting? Before the second century, the book of Acts was called The History of Christian Origins. As you all know, it's part two of a volume written by a first century Christian to a guy named Theophilus. And part one was called Luke, Luke. right? It was originally, you might like to know this, it was originally circulated as one volume. Yeah, Luke and then 
the history of Christian origins, yeah? Um, in fact, it's kind of awkward if you think about it. I think the reason why they put the book of John last in the order of the four Gospels is because it's so different than the other three, and it's the more theological one that they thought it made a good capstone. But if you think about it, if you took the book of John and you just switched places with Luke, then Luke would literally be one volume. It would go from Luke straight into Acts, right? Isn't that interesting? Okay, now just so you know, um, Luke is the traditional author. Um, um, some people have tried to undermine that. Um, one of the main commentaries, you guys should know this, that I will be using as I study Luke is F.F. F. Bruce, who is sort of considered, he was a Scottish guy, interesting guy. Um, and he is sort of like the, the, um, the main you know, guy for the, the book of Acts. And he is completely firm um, that Luke wrote it for sure. Okay, um, Luke, of course, is listed as a companion of Paul in Colossians chapter 4, verse 14. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. So Luke and Paul hung out, which is where Luke got a lot of this um, information, I'm sure. He was considered well-educated, and he writes in what is considered a high literary form of Greek. That's the kind of thing I would never know the difference of, but people that study this kind of thing, meaning he was obviously a very educated guy. In fact, I got more to say about that in just a second. Um, um, he, pro he, he very much obviously wrote a lot of this while Luke was still alive, while Paul was still alive, excuse me. And a lot of people really believe that Luke went to go hang out with Paul in prison in Rome and said, tell me what happened, yeah? Um, now, I got a great story for you about a Scottish scholar by the name of Sir William Ramsey, who lived between 1851 and 1939. He was a New Testament scholar and archaeologist out of Scotland. I kind of got a little bit ahead of myself. He began his career as an archaeologist who was schooled in this, uh, I didn't write the word down, Tunerin or something, uh, school. And they were taught that the New Testament was unreliable, right? That, in other words, you know what I mean by that? Unreliable. It's like, you know, I talked about last week. It's change. We don't really know. We can't really prove that it ever happened. And he is one of those classic guys. You probably already know how the story is going to go because there's a lot of them out there, right? So what he did was he went on an extended archaeological tour of Greece and Turkey, basically, and you know what ended up happening? The more evidence he found while he was studying, the more convinced he became that the New Testament um, was completely valid. And um, so in the late 19th century, oh, I, I'm gonna back up a little bit. He wanted to put together a map of the New Testament era. He almost used the book of Acts as an afterthought because he thought it was written as a theological apologetics but he radically changed his mind and he ended up writing a whole book about the stunning historicity and the veracity of the book of Acts. And this is what he said in his book. You may press the words of Luke, speaking of Acts, to a degree beyond any other historians and they stand the keenest scrutiny and the hardest treatment. He ended up believing that absolutely Paul was absolutely the author of all 13, not Hebrews, but the first 13 letters, and that Luke himself was a, as good a historian as any of the other ancient guys from Josephus and anything like that, that everything was there. Now, um, I thought what would be fun for us to do would be, uh, and you don't have to turn there if you don't want to, but is to just read um, the first the first um, couple of uh, verses of Luke, and then the first couple of verses from Acts. So Luke chapter one, verses one to four. <clears throat> this is from Luke. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those from whom the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Now, if you flip over to Acts chapter 1 and just read the first three verses, 
in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. So he basically, with that, he sort of um, gives this orderly account that you can be certain of what you have been taught. And then he sort of says, like, and so I gave you a full account of Jesus, and now he's going to turn and explain to this, O oh, lover of God, what happened next, right? And that's why this is called the Acts of the Apostles. Now, to, um, the themes that we're going to be covering that continue from Luke is Jesus as universal Savior for both Jew and Gentile. Um, we're we're going to see in the book of Acts um, this fantastic story of how God convinces Peter of this with the sheet that comes down uh, while he's waiting for Cornelius to come visit him with the unclean animals. And, and basically God saying, hey, don't call unclean what I have called clean, as he calls Peter now out to go witness to the unclean Gentiles. Um, one of the obvious major themes in the book of Acts will be the transition from Jewish faith and Jewish ceremony and Jewish ritual to a new Gentile church, and also the reaction of Jews who either accept or are, are become in opposition to this new way of worshiping God. But there's also a link um, to the Old Testament here. Um, one of the earliest heresies that began to form in the earliest church, I've mentioned this a few times before, is Gnosticism, this idea, and Mar Marcionism, which is this idea that the Old Testament God was a different God, that he was sort of the mean, rule-keeping God, right? And then Jesus, the good God, comes to die for us, to protect us from the Old Testament. Testament God. What a really lousy theology that is, yeah? But by the way, that was an early heresy that had to be shut down. And so the book of Acts is going to constantly look back to the Old Testament to show that everything that's happening now in the church has its roots in the Old Testament and in the root with the old the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh, okay? Um, also, the Holy Spirit is going to uh, is going to be front and center. Um, instead of calling it the Acts of the Apostles, which would really be the Acts of Peter, Paul, and a smattering of Stephen, Philip, um, it could also be called the Act of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles, because they're going to be talking about the whole. In fact, um, the, there's more mention of the Holy Spirit in the in the Book of Acts than all four Gospels combined, fifty four times it appears. Um, in the book of Acts, the next nearest book would be Romans 28 times. So almost half. So the book of Acts, all about the Holy um, Spirit, okay? Um, by the way, I, this is kind of a no-brainer, but just in case somebody doesn't know this, what's the difference about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament and the New Testament regarding believers? In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would visit. Uh, it, would come a, it would come upon a prophet or a healer or a king who would do, uh, do a function for God by the power of the Holy Spirit, and then it would go away. In the New Testament, as we read in Ephesians 1, yeah, the Holy Spirit now indwells us, which, by the way, is what makes us the living temple, because Yahweh, you know, the, I mean, the Spirit, or Yahweh, whatever, no longer dwells in the Holy of Holies behind the thick curtain, right? In the old temple, the old temple's been destroyed. Well, not yet, but you know, get my point. Now it is, yeah. We are the temple of God, and the Holy Spirit now dwells in us, and it stays. It does not leave. It is, a, um, Paul calls it a seal. We have been sealed with the Holy Spirit as a guaranteed deposit on our salvation. So good answer, exactly, yeah. Um, okay, um, in, the, um, in the book of Acts, the theme will also continue that there will be external oppression from both Jewish and Roman sources, and there's going to be internal strife. Remember, like I gave you that illustration at the beginning about how, you know, how quickly would we change? And you think that might cause some strife in the church? Oh, you better believe it. And it's going to happen, yeah? Um, by the way, we hate the idea of oppression from outside and internal strife, but it does seem to propel the church forward, yeah? Whenever, whenever the outside world pressures the church, it moves. It's always a good thing for the church. Um, obviously, it was Jews and Romans that attempted to stamp out um, the church. 
um, but they had a lot of internal strife regarding church government, which laws, which foods, um, circumcision, we're going to cover that, was a big issue, and what festivals to keep, right? Um, the church as a witness is another uh, theme. You know, Jesus says in verse 8, and we're going to cover that tonight, because we're only doing eight verses tonight, you know, you will be my witnesses. So the church is a witness and the Holy Spirit is a witness in the book of Acts. Um, we're also going to cover community life, um, passionate about the mission, caring for each other, overcoming internal strife with unity. And lastly, prayer. Uh, there will be heaps of prayer in the book of Acts. In fact, 14 of the first 15 chapters have some form of prayer in them. Yeah. Okay. So those are the major themes all through the book of Acts that we'll cover. And a lot of that is actually a carryover, carryover themes uh, from the book of Luke. So um, we already read the first three verses then. Um, again, uh, to um, Lucinda's point, Theophilus, Theophilus, God, lover of God, is either a specific guy or it's to all lovers of God. By the way, some people have speculated that Theophilus was either a Roman official or Paul's lawyer. <laughs> Can a lawyer be a lover? No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, you know, it's funny. I don't know. I don't know. I read these things and I think they're interesting, so I write them down, but I have no idea where anybody got the idea. It might be Paul's lawyer. Okay, in the first three verses here, Luke kind of summarizes his own first volume, right? The fact that, you know, um, you know, Jesus came and fulfilled all these things after suffering, showed himself to many men, gave many convincing proofs, appeared to them over a period of 40 days. Um, he tells us that Jesus taught about the kingdom of God for 40 days, um, um, offering many proofs that he was alive. Um, that was... Um, would, would be a verse that they would use to sort of come against the Gnostics who believe that Jesus was never material, that he was only a ghost, but we know for a fact that Jesus ate after his resurrection and things like that, yeah? And, um, and this was important and would um, fuel the spread of the gospel, the fact that he has risen indeed. So Luke goes back to that point to make that point again. And so now um, he kind of starts a little bit um, with a reviewing of the commission. So let's pick it up now. Uh, Acts chapter 1. Let's read verses 4 to 5. On one occasion, this is still talking about Jesus in his resurrected state before the ascension, while he was eating with them. And if you're an underliner, underline eating with them. He gave them this commission. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, I love the fact that he's eating again. Kind of like Brad Pitt in a movie. Yeah. You ever notice that? Brad Pitt's always eating, whatever, in whatever movie he's in. He's always sort of, I don't know, I don't know what, why. That's, uh, that's a thing. Um, what's that? He smoked. He smoked too? Oh, Brad Pitt did? Uh, I don't remember that part. Well, Jesus didn't smoke. Yeah. They didn't have smoking in Jesus' time. Okay. <laughs> Um, but it's interesting, it's one of those little interesting little tidbits that Luke, the doctor, right, the doctor puts in that Jesus was eating, right? He has a physical body, his resurrected body. Even though he would appear and disappear when he appeared, he had a physical body. He could eat, right? Now, um, some people have thought that maybe when it says um, he was eating with them, maybe that was communion, just, that's one of those things. I don't know what. And then he says, wait for what he promised. Um, and this, of course, is from um, John 16, uh, verses 5 to 11, when he says, the Holy Spirit will convict of sin, reveal righteousness. Um, well, this is what he says. In, in John 16, he gives a description of what the Holy Spirit will do. It will convict of sin, which, of course, allows the setup for salvation. The Holy Spirit will reveal righteousness because Jesus will no longer be around to be the standard of righteousness. Now we have the Holy Spirit to reveal. If you think about it, that's the point of Romans chapter 12 um, when it says by the transformation and the renewing of our minds, the outcome of that is we will know what God's perfect and life-giving will is, right? His standard of righteousness. And then obviously the Holy Spirit also will reveal God's ultimate 
victory. So according to um, John the Baptist, um, he said, I baptize with water, but he, is, he who is mightier than I will baptize with the Holy Spirit, referring to the time of Pentecost. Oh my gosh. We're, well, we got, we're almost done. Let's give you the earliest teaching ever. It's funny because I had five pages. Did I skip a page? No. All right. Well, cool. If we have time for questions or uh, conversation, we're going to have plenty of time. And nobody's ever complained about a short lesson. So, um, so let's read verse 6. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Prior to your point, what do they think he was going to do? Throw Rome off. Look at how that hasn't changed. Even after the resurrection, Jesus is walking around in his resurrected body. And they're like, okay, now, <laughs> right? Now, now, you know, now, now do we start stockpiling weapons or whatever? Yeah. They still lack a full understanding of the mission of Jesus, but he's about to give it to them. In fact, this question sets up the commission that Jesus is going to give them, yeah? Now, what's interesting, and I noticed this on my own, so I want to roll this by you. What they actually ask is, um, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? But if you think about it, what Jesus is actually instilling is the kingdom of God. Do you see the difference there, yeah? He's not going to restore the kingdom to Israel. But what they're going to go do is they're going to go out and they're going to actually perpetuate the kingdom of God. And you know, if you want to ask what the kingdom of God is, we could do a 10-week study on what the kingdom of God is, right? But one of the simplest explanations I ever heard about what the kingdom of God is, is wherever God's will is being done, is where the kingdom of God is. And if you remember... Um, I believe it was instituted on the cross because Jesus says, I will not drink again of the vine until I have come into my kingdom. And then the very last thing he does on the cross is he says, I thirst. And they give him the bitter wine, the vinegar wine. He takes a sip and then he says, it is finished. And at that point now, the kingdom of God will be going out around the whole planet through Holy Spirit indwelt believers going out and doing God's will. Does that make sense? Yeah? I don't know if I... Yeah, okay, I'll just keep going. Yeah, but does that look good? Okay, and so when they met together, they asked him, okay, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus lovingly says no by saying this. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority... So notice he, kind of, you can see them kind of going, thank you, but <laughs> maybe you didn't hear us the first time, sovereign creator of the universe. Maybe you didn't hear the question, right? Um, basically what he says, it's not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority. This is sort of a roundabout way of saying what you need to do is trust God. We're not going to talk politics about this, right? This is not his concern, right? And by the way, this is the last time the apostles are going to still be reverting to this way of thinking, right? Because from here on out, after what Jesus says next, they are going to get fully on board with the new program. And they're going to turn and face the rest of the world and be dedicated to the commission that Jesus is about to give them. So from verse 8, he says this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So it fits perfect with their question. Is now we're going to restore? No. But you will receive power and you will be my witnesses. This is the kingdom that Jesus is talking about. You will be witnesses. And then I'm sure you've probably all heard this taught in a sermon before. The idea that, you know, we share Christ in Jerusalem, which is where we are right now. It's like saying, you know, poipu, 
right, you know? And in all of Judea, which would be like, and Kauai, right? <laughs> and Samaria, which would mean all those pagans over on Oahu, right? <laughs> Sorry, anybody from Oahu, yeah. But, yeah? And then ultimately to all the world, yeah? Now, notice how he links it all to the Holy Spirit. Yeah, don't miss that. Who will give you power to do all this. The Holy Spirit is the power behind all evangelism, which, by the way, reminds me of a, um, a very clever quote about when you share Christ with people. And that is, um, we should spend more time talking to God about people than talking to people about God. Because it's the Holy Spirit that will bring people to the conviction of sin, right? Not our great words. <laughs> yeah. So we ask God, Lord, would you save my friend, my brother, my, you know, who, my whoever. Yeah, this and that. And then, okay, I already talked about Jerusalem, the here and now, Judea, which would be the nation of Israel. Samaria is kind of, of course, their second cousins and the ends of the earth will be Rome and beyond. And the book of Acts is going to follow this command because this is exactly what's going to happen. It's going to go from Jerusalem, and then it's going to go out to the Samaritans, and then it's going to go out to all of Israel, and then it's going to go all the way to Rome, which actually at that time was pretty much kind of considered the ends of the earth at that time. Um, but by the way, just um, I know I shared this when I shared that history story, but it's worth saying again, it's pretty cool how God set it up for all of that to happen. Because as you know, the, the gospel went out, and then it ended up getting into Rome, and then my ancestors and some of yours, the, um, the Goths, the Visigoths, the, the barbarians came down, they all got baptized and saved, they went back to Northern Europe, who of course invented the compass <laughs> and the sextant, yeah, and then went sailing all around the world, and you know, you know, part of what they were doing was doing horrible things, but part of it also was spreading the gospel, and somehow the gospel ended up going all around the entire planet. Yes, Briar? My guess is on this, Briar, is that their conception of a kingdom of God was an earthly kingdom. And the reason why, and you can't fault them for that either, because the whole Old Testament, remember I've said this before, the Old Testament is all physical realities that point to spiritual realities that are then fulfilled in the New Testament in Christ. To give you an example, uh, the tabernacle, tabernacle, for example, is this interesting picture of heaven, right? You know, where the presence of God is in the Holy of Holies, but you can't get to the presence of God. And so God, you know, to make a picture, a physical picture of the spiritual reality, he has the high priest drench himself in blood of a lamb, once a year so he can go in and make sacrifice at this altar which has to be hidden behind a thick curtain right then christ comes on his death the curtain splits right and institutes this whole new concept that by receiving the blood of christ we now can enter into the presence of god and so it's a physical reality that finds its spiritual fulfillment now, that's why so much of the Old Testament talks about when God blesses you. What, what is the old, I mean, give me some examples of what, is, what does it mean to be blessed in the Old Testament? Anybody? Children. Children, yeah, that's exactly, Lucinda. In fact, that's great, Lucinda, because that is maybe the big one, right? You know, because poor Sarah, guys, you know, anybody, you know, when, you know, when they were all crying out to God, the worst thing that could happen is you couldn't have children, right? You know, or whatever, this and that. That was a big deal in the old. That was brilliant, Lucinda. Anybody else? What else? Shalom. I'm sorry? Livestock. livestock. Yeah, livestock. Yeah. Shalom. Shalom, which is peace, which is interesting. And that would be like peace with who? Your enemies. Now, we know it mean, we means like a peace with God and everything like that. But these guys were constantly at battle and warfare. In fact, that would be another one. God, How did God bless you in the Old Testament? You had victory over yeah. your enemies, right? Um, he would give you, what else? I, I shouldn't give, name them all. Anybody else? What, how? Land. land. That, was, that was my next one I was going to think. Land. Yeah. Yeah, you get land. You get pregnant, <laughs> right? You conquer your enemies. Yeah. This is the Old Testament 
blessing, yeah? But in the New Testament, your blessing is the Holy Spirit indwelling you with this sort of supernatural peace, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Not one of those things is physical. Physical things can bring about those things, but not one of those things can you put in a test tube and do experiments on, right? Right? And so to your point, let me finish, and Karis, I'll come to you. To your point, it's an excellent point, Briar. These Jewish scholars prior to Christ, they're looking, when they think of the kingdom of God, you can't blame them for thinking of a physical, earthly kingdom. Because remember, the great thing about David was his obedience to God. He tore down all the high places. He made temple worship the focus of Israel, right? He was a God-loving king. And in response, they finally finished the Great Commission. Their great, remember, what was their Great Commission? Conquer the Promised Land, right? Did, do you ever realize this, that it only happened under David? That prior to David, you know, because, um, you know, when God tells Abraham and he lays out the, you know, here's the, here's the land I'm going to give you and from here to there and from here to there, it only fully comes to fruition under David. And he hands the whole thing off to Solomon and it doesn't even last through the entire time of Solomon. They start losing land to their enemies. And of course, you know, we all know what eventually happens. The whole thing shrinky dinks until there is no right kingdom at all. But because they honored God, God blessed them. And so now this is what they were thinking. Jesus is going to come, yeah? And he's going to establish the kingdom of God and give them all their land back. And everyone's going to get pregnant. Okay, uh, so basically uh, we've, we've got this uh, great commission. In fact, you know what? I, I'll, I'll come back and review this next week a little bit. I was going to save the ascension um, for last week. But since we've got uh, 15 minutes left and I'm done, let's just go ahead and read those last um, couple of verses. Uh, let's start in 9. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. And you got to love this next line. They were looking intently up in the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go in to heaven. Dun, 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 dun. I just love the fact that they're looking and it's almost like they get scoldings. Why are you guys looking up there? And then they go, because he's going to come back the same way. And you can picture him going, well, that's why we're looking, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, you know, we'll explain it a little bit more next time. So I kind of wrote here in my notes on your mark, get set. And then we'll come back next week, yeah? Because they're going to they're gonna go. We've got a lot to learn. I'm, excuse me, what I meant, they've got a lot to learn, yeah? About how to figure out this new way of walking with God, doing God's will, doing God's commission in a whole new way. And by the way, it's not surprising that it sort of begins, they sort of hang out in Jerusalem. And if you're aware, sorry, this would be a bit of a plot spoiler for some of you, maybe, um, they really don't leave Jerusalem until what happens? Persecution. Yeah? Which, again, kind of shows you how God can use persecution to get the church to go do what it's supposed to be doing. Because the Holy, we're going to see what happens. The Holy Spirit comes down. All this really cool stuff is happening. About 5,000 people in Jerusalem get saved. And they're like, hey, this is great. And then God's like, did you forget about um, Samaria and the rest of the world, guys? And they're like, this is great. And God's like, eh, okay, we'll, do, we'll deal with this, yeah. <laughs> and the persecution happens. And then it says they scattered. Yeah, they scattered. Anyways, yeah. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Mona, it, the spirit is like the, the energetic arm of God. Yeah, absolutely. And, and by the way, Mona's point, her first point, if you didn't hear it on the camera, needs to be said. The spirit is a person, not a thing. And um, if you didn't know that, you need to know that. I didn't know that for years. In fact, Mike Wellman kind of schooled me on that. Yeah, uh, we, don't ref we never refer to the Holy Spirit like as an it, you know, cousin it or something like that. 
Yes, Donna. Um, if I can summarize for the camera, Donna's point is really good. Is just as Christ walked by the power of the Holy Spirit, now so do we, which makes us little Christs or Christians. And, and again, and I know I'm kind of hammering this point in tonight, but think how different that's going to be for believers. And that's why the book of Acts is so critical because they're going to be figuring out a lot of it about how, how to do, and I, I use the word church, but they had never used that word before, right? Church now is something completely different than being, say, the nation of Israel. And by the way, um, if you didn't know that, the name for church, ecclesia, means the called out ones. Yeah, those who have been called by God. Ecclesia is the Greek word for church. And that's different than a nation. Prior, it was the, the kingdom of God would be the same thing as the nation of Israel, right? Way different than called out ones. Yeah, they've been called by what? The Holy Spirit, right? Yeah, excellent point, Don. Yeah, anybody else? Mike? Is there a reason why Jesus had to leave before the Spirit came down? I don't know that there was a reason, but it's interesting that he says, I will send the Spirit. And he, but, he, but you know, okay. There was a conversation that he says, I cannot yeah, I was, leave because if I don't go, then he can't come. cannot come. So there's a reason, Mike, and the reason is, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but clearly, to Donna's point, there is a reason because he says, I, unless I go, the Spirit won't come, right? But I am going to go. Isn't that when he says to go make a place for you in heaven, right? So, but I have to go so that the spirit can come. Lorraine? Yeah, that's a good, and that's a good point too. We, ha we have to, uh, yeah, he had, he had to die. For, that's a good point. He at least has to die. It doesn't necessarily cover the ascension, but it does cover the first part, which is, by the way, it's an excellent point, Lorraine, that, yeah, he cannot come dwell in us in our in our. In our, un, I want to say unjustified, because we're still not sanctified, but we have been declared justified, which enables the Holy Spirit now to indwell us and make us a temple. That's really good, Lorraine. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah. Uh, yes, Daniel. Uh, I would go back to Lorraine's point. Yeah, Jesus has to die, be resurrected, conquer death. And then I don't quite get why he had to ascend before the Spirit would come because I, I'm with you. I don't know why the spirit couldn't be, you know, well, you know, it's interesting. Here's a really interesting theological conundrum that I don't know the answer to, but your question just brought it up. Jesus prior to his death and resurrection is hundred percent man and hundred percent God, right? He's walking around in a human physical body. However, we know that none of the miracles he did was by his own power. He laid down his power when he came to earth. The miracles that he did was by the power of the Holy Spirit. But in his resurrected body, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know what he's doing. Is he doing it by the power of the Holy Spirit? Or is that a whole different ball of wax, Mike? Yeah, he was physical, but, but he's in his resurrected body, which is different than the human body that he had prior. But nobody really knows much about that new, because that new physical body could appear and disappear and do all kinds of things that he wasn't doing before. But the question is, was he doing that by the power of the Holy Spirit or was he, I don't know. I, I get the feeling not. I get the feeling his resurrected body was perhaps somewhat like his Old Testament appearances like maybe Melchizedek style or the, the guys that talk to Abraham. You know, when, you know what a Christophany is when Christ appears in the Old Testament, you know? Transfiguration. Transfiguration. Oh, the tra yeah, the transfigured self. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, just I'm asking questions I don't have answers to. Anyways, hang on, Tom. Mona was first. Sorry. So, so if you missed that on the camera, Mona was talking with a Muslim today. Muslims, yeah, or at least, I want to say at least this Muslim does not believe in the resurrection of Christ. I got it. Right. Got it. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. That's really interesting. So, yeah, with, with the resurrection, their theology is destroyed. <laughs> And without the resurrection, our theology is destroyed. That's interesting. By the way, if I could recommend a fantastic book that somebody sort of made me read, <laughs> and it was really, really fantastic, 
Um, it's called um, Searching for, or either Chasing Allah, Finding Jesus, or Searching for Allah, Finding Jesus. Seeking. Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. I started the book thinking that it was just going to be a great story about a Muslim guy coming to Christ. What blew me away was it you that gave me the book? Tom, it was you. That gave, thank you, Tom. I remember, I, I look over, it's like, you know, it's a bandito over there. Yeah, sorry. But, that, but thank you, by the way. Um, is, it, was, it is perhaps the greatest book of apologetics I've ever read. Did you say so, Tom? I, I think it's better than Lee Strobel's Case for Christ. It's amazing. And the reason why is because the Muslim who writes the book is a genius. I mean, for lack of a, would you say that? He's like a, is he a microbiologist, physicist? What is, I, I, I forget, but he is at the highest level of education and uh, has a Christian roommate in med school who, say, who you know, keeps sharing Christ with him and says, well, have you ever read the Bible? And he's like, no, but it's all fake. And he says, well, why don't you read the Bible and prove it's fake and, and then come talk to me. And of course that launches which is interesting because we actually started tonight's Bible study with somebody that went out to disprove the, um, the veracity of Scripture and then became one of the greatest advocates for the veracity of Scripture, and that was that Sir William Ramsey or whatever his name was, the Scottish, Scottish scholar who ended up writing a whole book about um, the truths of Scripture based on the archaeology that he'd found. And by the way, another guy, another guy that did that is the guy that wrote Ben-Hur, was an uh, English colonel, I think he was, um, who on a, on a train going from London up to Oxford, he said, you know what, if I could just disprove the Bible, then, we'd ha then we could put it all to rest and move on with the world. And he actually thought by disproving the Bible, he was going to help the planet or something, you know. And you all know the rest of the story. You can imagine what happened. The more he went out to disprove the Bible, he couldn't deny the truth. And I highly recommend that book, Seeking All of Finding Jesus. Um, it's a really good read. And um, yeah, if you order it, anyways, go ahead. let's pray. Father God, thank you for this night, Lord. Thank you, um, Lord, for putting this all together, Lord. It's amazing looking back across history and seeing your hand in all of this and how it all fits together so perfectly over thousands of years and all of it declaring you and the reality of you, the physical reality of you in the Old Testament leading to the spiritual reality that we enjoy now, God. And so we're grateful, God, that your word reveals you and ties it all together, giving us proof after proof after proof, God. We, we believe now, Lord, and so we look forward uh, to seeing how you move through these guys, how you establish the church, and um, what we can learn from that and how we do church and how we go about um, bringing your kingdom, God, down here to this place and leading people to knowing you. Father, thank you for that. We lift up our sister Lily. We ask right now by the power and authority of your great name, Jesus Christ, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, that right now, even as we pray, you'd be healing Lily's back right now, Lord, that she would resume her vigorous self that we know her to be in Jesus Christ's name. Oh, you know what? Since we're praying, we continue to lift up the Hoff family, Lord, and ask healing for the Hoff family. Father, who've suffered such a tragedy this week, we just continue to pray, Father, that your tangible presence would be made known to them, that they would have a supernatural peace, Lord, in the face of this tragedy, God, and that it would be undeniable that the source of that peace is you, Father. I pray that this would be a, uh, what does Rick call, a hard mercy for them, that out of this tragedy, they would have a newfound faith and joy, and they find it in you, and that it would glorify you. To the glory of your name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen? Amen. Amen.